I'm going to read from God's Word. Psalm 86, verses 15 and 16. The Word says, But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Amen. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, we're gathered here today to worship God Almighty, our God. And we are sinners and we fail. So let's pray a prayer of repentance. Let's ask the Lord for mercy. We lift up your voices and your hearts with me as we go to the Lord in prayer in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, mighty God, we humble ourselves before you. We know that you are holy and righteous, God Almighty. And we know, Lord, we are sinners and we have failed you time and time again, Lord, because we are weak, Lord, and we need your forgiveness. We need your mercy. We need your grace. We need your Son who is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the Holy One of God. And because of Him, we come here to worship You, Lord. May Your Holy Spirit anoint us, Lord. Use us and lead us and guide us for Your glory. As we repent, Lord, fill us, Lord, with Yourself. Give us strength for we are weak. And let us be, Lord, in Your presence. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for every family and every soul that's represented by the International Baptist Church. And the church, Lord, throughout the world, we lift up to you this day. This is the Lord's day. This is the day, Lord, we want to dedicate to you. We want to worship you. We want to worship you in spirit. We need you, Lord. Because in our weakness, Lord, we fail. But, Lord, we want to give you glory. We want to please you, Lord. Help us to put away the world and put your shield and your protection around us all. Let us, Lord, be humble humble before you, knowing that you are God Almighty and that you are a loving God. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now we're going to sing, Leaning on Jesus. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting heart. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting heart. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, a faith and secure from all along. Leaning on the everlasting home. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting home. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting home. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. A safe and secure from all the harm. I lean in on the everlasting home. What have I to fear? What have I to dread? Lean in on the everlasting home. I have blessed peace with my Lord to Lean in on the everlasting home. Lean on him, lean on him. I safe and secure from all of Leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. Now we're going to sing Our God Reigns. How lovely home the mountains are, the feet of him. Who brings good news? Who brings good news? Proclaim his peace, announce 
we're going to glorify Jesus, I ask that you please stand with me, and I ask that you repeat after me, please. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. And as you're taking your seats, turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 10. We're going to read the whole chapter this morning. That's 22 verses. That's Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. Sister Wazel will read for us in the Korean language. Sister Wazel, please. 오늘 하나님이 주신 말씀입니다. 에스겔스 10장 1절에서 22절입니다. 이에 내가 보니 고루돌 머리 위 궁창에 남보석 같은 것이 나타나는데 그들 위에 보좌의 형상이 있는 것 같더라. 하나님이 가는 배 옷을 입은 사람에게 말씀하여 이르시되 너는 구름 밑에 있는 바퀴 사이로 들어가 그 속에서 숯불을 두 손에 가득히 움켜 가지고 성음 위에 허트라 하시매 그가 내 목전에서 들어가니라. 그 사람이 들어갈 때 구루돌은 성전 오른쪽에 서 있고 구름은 안뜰에 가득하며 여호와의 영광이 그룹에서 올라와 성전 문지방에 이르니 구름이 성전에 가득하며 여호와의 영화로운 강체가 뜰에 가득하였고 그룹들의 날개 소리는 바깥들까지 들리는데 전능하신 하나님 말씀하시는 음성 같더라 하나님이 가는 배 옷을 입은 자에게 명령하시기를 바퀴 사이고 그룹들 사이에서 불을 가져가라 하셨으므로 그가 그들 들어가 바퀴 옆에 섬에 그 그룹이 그룹들 사이에 손을 내밀어 그 그룹들 사이에 있는 불을 집어 가는 배 옷을 입은 자의 손에 주매 그가 받아 가지고 나가는데 그룹들의 날개 밑에 사람의 손 같은 것이 나타나더라 내가 보니 그룹들 곁에 네 바퀴가 있는데 이 그룹 곁에 한 바퀴가 있고 저 그룹 곁에 한 바퀴가 있으며 그 바퀴 모양은 항옥 같으며 그 모양은 내 식구 같은 네 마치 바퀴 안에 바퀴가 있는 것 같으며 그룹들이 나아갈 때에 사방으로 몸을 돌리지 아니하고 나아가되 몸을 돌리지 아니하고 그 머리 향한 곳으로 나아가며 그 온몸과 등과 손과 날개와 바퀴 있고 네 그룹을 바퀴에 둘리에 다 눈이 가득하더라 내가 들으니 그 바퀴들을 도는 것이라 부르며 그룹들에게는 각기 네 면이 있는데 첫째 면은 그룹의 얼굴이요 둘째 면은 사람의 얼굴이요 셋째는 사자의 얼굴이요 넷째는 독수리의 얼굴이더라 그룹들이 올라가니 그들은 내가 그발 강가에서 보던 생물이라 그룹들이 나아갈 때에 바퀴도 그 곁에 나가고 그룹들이 나기를 들고 땅에 올라가려 할 때도 바퀴가 그 곁을 떠나지 아니하며 그들이 서며 이들도 서고 그들이 올라가며 이들도 함께 올라가니 이는 생물의 영이 바퀴 가운데 있음이더라 여호와의 영광이 성전 문지방을 떠나서 그룹들 위에 머무르니 그룹들이 날개를 들고 내눈 앞에 땅에 올라가는데 그들이 나갈 때에 바퀴도 그 곁에서 함께 하더라 
그들이 여호와의 전으로 들어가는 동문에 머물고 이스라엘 하나님의 영광이 거위에 덮였더라. 그것은 내가 그발 강가에 보던 이스라엘 하나님 아래에 있는 생물이라 그들이 그룹인 줄을 내가 아니라 각기 내 얼굴과 내 날개가 있으며 날개 밑에는 사람의 선 현상이 있으니 그 얼굴의 형상은 내가 그발 강가에서 보던 얼굴이며 그 모양과 그 몸도 그리하며 각기 곱게 앞으로 가더라. Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. I looked and I saw the likeness of a throne of sapphire above the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim. The Lord said to the man clothed in linen, Go in among the wheels beneath the cherubim, fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And, and as I watched, he went in. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple, and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. The sound of the wings of the cherubim could be heard as far away as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. When the Lord commanded the man in linen, take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim, the man went in and stood beside a wheel. Then one of the cherubim reached out his hand to the fire that was among them. He took up some of it and put it into the hands of the man in linen, who took it and went out. Under the wings of the cherubim could be seen what looked like hands of man. I looked and I saw beside the cherubim four wheels, one beside each of the cherubim. The wheels sparkled like crystallite. As for their appearance, the four of them looked alike. Each was like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in and any one of the four directions the cherubim faced. The wheels did not turn about as the cherubim went. The cherubim went in whatever direction the head and face, without turning as they went. Their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands, and their wings, were completely full of eyes, as were their four wheels. I heard the wheels being called the whirling wheels. Each of the cherubim had four faces. One face was that of a cherubim. The second, the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. When the cherubim rose upward... These were the living creatures I had seen by the Kibar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the cherubim spread their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels did not leave their side. When the cherubim stood still, they also stood still. When the cherubim rose, they rose with them, because the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple, and stopped above the cherubim. While I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground, and as they went, the wheels went with them. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house. The glory of God of Israel was above them. These were the living creatures I had seen beneath the God of Israel by the Kibar River, and I realized that they were cherubim. Each had four faces, four wings, and under their wings was what looked like the hands of a man. Their faces had the same appearance as those I had seen by the Kibar River. Each one went straight ahead. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message and these people who are here to receive it. Oh, Lord, we pray that your Spirit would give us wisdom and understanding, that, Lord, that we would draw near to you through this word and through this message, that you would be pleased with us, Lord, and your perfect will would be done. For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. So this morning, this scene is very... Uh, may be strange, but it's God departs of what it is, because in our text today, God is leading 
his earthly home, the temple. He's leaving it. And he has paused at the threshold. He stopped at the threshold. And I believe he stopped there because I don't think he really wanted to leave. You know, listen, our God is a God of love. Most of all, he loves us and loves us and loves us and his love endures forever. Yes, it is true that God's perfect holiness demands that he be a just God and that he punish his sin. That's because of his character and who he is. He must do that. But that's not because he wants to do it. He does it because he is a just God. But when I read the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations and Ezekiel, when I read those books, and these books have lots of really sad, sad chapters in it, but I still see over and over and over again God is pleading. He pleads with his people to stop their evil, to turn back to him so that he will not have to bring his wrath upon his people. I mean, over and over again, he keeps saying, repent and return to me. Repent and return to me. Repent and return to me. Over and over. You see, God does not want to be a God of judgment because he loves us. You know, I'm amazed at his majesty and, and every other great characteristic of God. So I believe that as a heartbroken lover, he pauses. He pauses at the threshold, and not just at the threshold, but you're going to see more times later on in, in Ezekiel, he, 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 he pauses and looks back and hesitates. He doesn't want to depart. But he has to remain true to who he is. He has to leave. He has decided that he will have no more of this. No more of it. And when the Babylonians come, and they most certainly will because his will says that they will, they will come and they will destroy. And when they destroy Jerusalem, when they destroy that temple, it will not be a godly temple. It will be a house. It will not be a godly, holy city. It will just be another city because God will not be there. So let's consider our text. Every time I read this, this chapter, I have more questions and, and I pray real hard for more wisdom and understanding. But first, let's consider, I pulled out just a few things, the burning coals. In verses 1 through 7, God is addressing this man dressed in, in linen. Remember, he, we've already been introduced to him. The wheels and the cherubim were also in chapter 1, and they're here. And, and the chariot of God was introduced to us in chapter 1, and they're here. And this time, though, it is in Jerusalem not at the Kibar River, it's in Jerusalem at the te temple, and it's there with a purpose. And that purpose is to carry God Almighty, His glory, away from Jerusalem and the temple. Ezekiel faces, uh, sort of focuses here on the crystal clear flat area that was between the cherubim and the Lord's throne. Now, the Holy supreme, majestic seat was the likeness of sapphire that had sort of a blue tint or a blue appearance to it. And in chapter 9, for the first time in Ezekiel, we are told the name of God's charioteers, the cherubim. Earlier, they weren't called cherubim. You know what they were called? The creatures. They didn't have a name. They were called creatures. Back in chapter 9, the, the man clothed in linen was the angel with the writing kit. Remember, he went in and wrote and had this writing kit. And he marked the, the Lord's selected survivors, those who were what? Those who were lamenting and crying over what was going on. 
He was instructed to go under the cherubim between the whirling wheels to fill his hands with coals of fire. Fill his hands. Both hands. A couple of things here I want to point out to you. For one thing, I find the term uh, whirling wheels interesting. This is a wheel with a wheel inside of it or intersecting it with it that could move in any direction. Also, you know, think about this. Is sometimes I think, of, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking about tornadoes because, you know, tornadoes are pretty common in this area. And tornadoes, they, these look like wheels, don't they, when they twirl around and around and with a circular movement and, and wheels inside of wheels that's moving around. If you've ever watched a tornado, it's amazing how it moves in any direction at any time. It, can, it don't have to go straight. It can just move. Uh, I used to watch uh, little dust devils out in the desert out in, in uh, white sands, and boy, they were very in watch. You never knew what they were going to do. They were just mind small tornadoes, and they moved just like we read right here. Could it be that these whirling wheels are a type of tornado that was under this glass surface? Was that what this is looking at? Also, now some equate these whirling wheels to, you know what, flying saucers. I sort of find that very interesting also. And it's clearly something to think about because I don't see why it couldn't be what we today might call a flying saucer. But that's not the point today, and I don't really want to get wrapped up in that because, to be honest with you, that's not important. Notice also the instruction to the angel here is to fill both his hands of coal. He was instructed not to grab just a handful, but to fill both his hands with burning coal. Let's think about burning coals for a second. Please turn in your Bibles with me to the book of 2 Samuel 22. If you have your Bibles open, I hope you do. 2 Samuel 22. Second Samuel 22, we're going to read verses 9 through 13. Ask that you follow along as I read, please. 2 Samuel 22, 9 through 13. The word says, Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. The dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, bolts of lightning blazed Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. When you look at Psalm 18, Psalm 18, 8 says, Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth, and burning coals blazed out of it. Again, this is the same words that's in 2 Samuel. Coals of fire are described directly kindled by God. Every place where you find it, it is by God that he kindled these goals of fire in his majestic and wrathful advance, for the cherubim are also present, and judgment seems to follow. So, there the coals of fire are, and they were seen as connected with the coming judgment of God. The sight of this angel in the linen apparel performing the instructions of the holy God Yahweh clearly affected Ezekiel. He saw all these particular uh, incidents and he described them very detailed to us and to me that shows that he wanted to make sure that we, his readers, people who read his word, people who read this, that they saw it and understood it and saw what he was aware of what he saw. Verse 4 of our text says, Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. Now this is it. The position of God's chariot is now described to us. It was on the south side of the temple, and notice it's still called the temple at this point, 
but it's soon going to be just a house. And the reason it's going to be just a house, it will be a house because God will not be there anymore. The house will be an ordinary building as far as God is concerned. It'll just be another building. It won't be his house. Let me tell you something. Hopefully you realize this. God's presence makes everything special. God's presence makes everything special. His presence in us makes us special. I am what I am because God lives in me. But if he leaves me, then you know what? I'm just a regular sinner just like everybody else. It's the same with us all and with all things. If God's in us, we are special. Not because we are special, but because God is in us. When the cherubim started flapping their wings, Ezekiel, he was very moved by the sound. He talked about how loud it was and the sound that they made. The sound filled the whole building, even to the outer court. And it was powerful and strong as the voice of Ezekiel heard was from El Shaddai. He had heard this voice before. Again, we are reminded of the situation of our God, God Yahweh commanding a man clothed in linen to take fire from within the what? The whirling wheels between the cherubim. What are your thoughts today about thunder and lightning? I don't know about you, but, but I love uh, a thunderstorm. I know something, don't get me wrong, I respect it, but I really enjoy it when I know I can be in a safe place and I can watch God's lightning and hear the thunder. Don't you? I hope you enjoy it. Like, I, I love a good thunderstorm. I like to be safe, but I really love watching it and listening to it. And I really love the thunder when it's so loud that I can feel it vibrate through my body. You ever had that thunder just move, vibrate your bones? Yeah. That might be a little scary for some of you, but I like that too. Because let me tell you what, our God is an awesome God. And he's a powerful God. He is a powerful, powerful God. And to me, when I see that thunder and I, uh, I hear that thunder and I see that lightning, I say to myself, oh, hallelujah, praise God for his power. Here he is accompanied by fire and thunder and lightning. In fact, we get a good picture of his majesty from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. You can turn there if you want to, but I'm just going to read it straight out to you. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, you know what they did? They trembled with fear. That's what it says. They stayed at a distance and they said to Moses, Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But don't help God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance while Moses, he approached the thick darkness where God was. The people were scared. They were scared because of this majestic appearance of our holy God. How do you think Ezekiel felt when he saw all this? Back here in Ezekiel in our scripture, how do you think he felt when he was there in the presence of all that was going on? You can also imagine if these whirlers were, were actually little tornadoes, what an awesome display of power that would have been. The man or angel, obediently he went in and stood beside one of these whirling wheels. Picture also that these wheels were full of eyes and they were all focusing on him. That must be an awful strange sight to have all those eyes looking at you. 
The man could only go a certain distance, for please note that the cherubim reached forth his hand and put the fire. You know, the man could not go and pick up the coal. Did you notice it? He didn't go pick up the coal. The cherubim picked up the coal and handed it to the man. He handed it to the man. So the man took the coal and he went out. Do y'all notice anything strange about that part right there? He took the coal and he went out. What did he do with the coal? Because nothing further is heard of this man in linen who had the coal. He's not, he doesn't come up again in the book of Ezekiel. He doesn't come up again in another chapter. All we know is he took the coal which usually, remember I said, that's God's judgment, usually, purification. And he left. In fact, he gathered them, we think, based on everything we read, he gathered them to what? To scatter those coals over the city, the city of Jerusalem. And the scattering of the city was not there yet. We, we're just left here, I think, to assume that he carried out his task for Ezekiel is now wholly taken up with seeing the glory of the Lord and it seems like the coals that the man took are forgotten. We just assume that the angel cast the coals of God's judgment down on Jerusalem. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. We don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. We read throughout the Bible like the, the fire and the brimstone that the Lord cast down on who? Sodom and Gomorrah. And it totally destroyed them, right? The coals, the fire, the brimstone. It eliminated these cities totally. They never will return. But Jerusalem faced a different type of destruction. Jerusalem faced a destruction by man, not directly by God. Yes, God called the Babylonians to come and destroy Jerusalem, but he didn't destroy Jerusalem like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, he could have because these coals of fire were taken to do just that, but it didn't happen. Could it be now, y'all know me. I like to think about some things. And I like to come up with an answer. True or not, this is something I want you to think about. Could it be that these coals, God's wrath, which the man in linen was gathering, was for the end times, the final time of judgment that's called for in Revelation? 15 and 16. And that time is not here yet. Something to think about, don't you think? Don't you think it's something to think about? This is definitely something to think about because he's not talked about in these codes are not used yet as far as we know. That angel is still holding those coals. Let's talk about the cherubim and wheels for a second. Verses 8 through 11 are similar to what you see in chapter 1. Here the difference lies in the fact that he now calls the living creatures by their rightful name. He calls them cherubim, whereas before they were just living creatures. And once again, Ezekiel is struck with recognizing that the whirling wheels, are, they're connected to the angels in some way. They're, he can't see a physical connection, but they are certainly uh, connected because the chariot uh, could move in any direction, and neither could hinder its movement. Nothing could hinder its movement. Ezekiel was amazed at the way the chariot of God moved. He stood in awe at how the cherubim just had to look in a certain direction, and that's how they followed their gaze, the way they looked, and it was so smooth transition. 
We must take note of something that's very unique here, very unique in chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 14 of our text. Instead of lifting the face of an ox, did y'all catch this? I hope you remember this verse is, has Ezekiel saying that the first face was the face of a cherubim. If y'all remember, hopefully you remember when I, I gave you an explanation and I preached to you about the four faces of a Christian, the, the four faces of a spiritual man or woman. Do you remember that a week or so ago? Well, these four faces reflect the character of Jesus Christ in our lives. They were the faces of what? An ox. A man, an eagle, and a lion. Now, here it's a little different, and I've actually read a few commentators and com uh, what they said about this, and actually some commentators said that this is a scribal error, that the scribe made an error when they wrote it down. That the, maybe it was. I'm not here to debate that. But I personally think it was not an error. And then I'll tell you why. I have another reason, but I want to add this to it because it seems like the Holy Spirit is telling me to depart a little bit. What did I tell you the ox was? A servant, right? Worker. Ox, remember? What do you think the cherubim are? God's servants. Workers. They're the one doing most of the work here. And every place we see cherubim, they're working for God Almighty. Would they not be considered an ox? Would they not be considered workers? Now, I want to also remind you here that Ezekiel's vision was from the side. So the primary cherub is right in front of him. He sees the fourth-fold form of this cherubim in his direct eyesight. So he describes the whole form as the face of a cherubim. Then having a side view, Ezekiel then looks at each face, staring right back at him. The next cherubim has a man's face staring right back at him. The next one had the lion's face. Because uh, remember, you have one, you have them like that, right? So he's looking at the faces that are looking straight at him. And finally, the last in his sight is the eagle face. And they're all looking straight at him. This causes me to think of one more little insight here. And that is that there are always the four different faces looking at the same time, at the same thing. Think about that for a second. When you've got four separate faces, and they're all turned toward you, that same face goes all the way around. That face is looking at you. There's four different faces looking the same direction. If you looked at the cherubim from the north, you saw the lion. If you looked at the uh, eagle, for, uh, you could see the eagle, the man, and the ox. And if you looked east and south or the west, you'd always see the four different faces, depending on where you were. So it's something for me to think about and for you to think about. Then finally, we have God's departure. In verses 15 through 18, Ezekiel sort of ties all this together for us with his description of calling cherubim the living creatures. He tells us these, these cherubim are the living creatures that I saw. In addition, he emphasizes that the whirling wheels, as, as strange as this thing reveals, are all part of the cherubim. If, if you were Ezekiel, how would you be able to describe this amazing sight. I don't know how I would describe it. I would love to see exactly what he saw from a distance, obviously, because I think, I don't know if I could handle being in that presence like that, but I would love to see it, and I wonder how I would describe it. I wonder how you would describe it. Verse 18 says, Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. The glory of God, Yahweh, 
He now leaves the threshold of the temple and takes his rightful place on the very throne on his chariot. He's taken the east gate. The east gate, if you remember, was the main entrance to the temple courtyard. Later in chapter 11, God will leave this spot too and go to the Mount of Olives, which is sort of down the valley and up the hill on the east side of the temple mount. 1 Samuel 4, 4 says, So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And Ezekiel here, he closes out chapter 10 explaining that these were the living creatures that I had seen beneath the God of Israel by the Kibar River, and I realized that they are cherubim. So Ezekiel is trying to tie all this together and trying to help us understand what is going on here in this, this chapter, which, to say the least, is strange, a strange sight. You know, some things you and I can never understand about God because God's God Almighty. I can accept that. I hope you can too. There's some things we just can't grasp mentally. Now, someday, hallelujah, well, I can ask Jesus face to face. Hey, Jesus, what were those whirling wheels? And I know he's going to give me an answer. Maybe I'm not going to care, though. I'm going to be so happy, and I'm going to be enjoying being there in his presence. I'm going to forget all about those whirling wheels. And I think you are, too. But this description here of the chariot of God was so awesome and so unique that Ezekiel, he wants to tell you and I what he saw, that he saw the chariot of God, and he saw God leave Jerusalem. He saw him leave the temple. That was important, Ezekiel, so important, he wrote it down so we could understand it. After the coming of Jesus Christ, though, God keeps building a place for himself on earth. God is here today. The project continues because he sent his Holy Spirit here and he dwells within us. We are God's people and we are God's temple. We are God's temple, brothers and sisters. Today the Spirit works inside us a love for Christ and a desire to do his will. And his presence is in us. Hallelujah. When his presence fails, it's because we fail God. He never fails us. When the restoring of God's house is finally completed, and then heaven comes down to earth, all creation becomes a most holy place for God. If you don't understand that, read the book of Revelation. The city, the holy city of Jerusalem will come down to us. Hallelujah. And that's going to be a different, and we're going to be rejoicing, and we're going to be happy. When that house, God's house, is fully completed, in this whole place, this new earth, will be a completely holy place. Revelation 21.3 says, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Hallelujah. That's the day we should all look forward to when we will see the full glory of God and it will never, ever leave again. On the day when he ascended into heaven, Jesus left. But he didn't leave angry or upset. Jesus left only one time, and he had made peace between God and us. He made peace between God and us 
because he died for our sins. He paid the price. And this is what Jesus said when he left. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christ Jesus is with us forever. And I'm so glad that he is. Because without him, I could do nothing. And you could do nothing. So may we live like he is with us. When the world can't comfort us, Jesus can. When the world cannot encourage us, Jesus can. And he can help us to be more holy in all that we do. And only Jesus can do that. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, let us thank you, Lord, let us thank you for Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, your Son, the Holy One of God. We believe, Lord, that you redeemed us. You redeemed us because you died or you came our sin and died and took our place on that cross. And you were raised, Lord, in power of the Holy Spirit. And you hear us today, and we are acceptable, and we have your righteousness. Let your Holy Spirit anoint us. Help us, Lord, to remember that. Lord, to claim the promises that you have given to us. And Lord, to rejoice in the fact that your love for us endures forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And Lord, if there's someone here today and they don't know that love, they don't, they've not experienced that grace, they need Jesus, Lord. They need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They need to believe, Lord, that they're sinners and repent of their sins. They need to accept Him as their Lord and Savior. Lord, help us all, Lord, to live lives more worthy of You. Forgive us, Lord, for we have failed You. Let us rejoice in the fact that You are a good God, and you are our God, and it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand, please.